All right. Well, so today I'm just going to give you, um, you know, a very brief uh, overview of some of the work that we're doing in collective intelligence and teams and what we're really starting to get into with artificial intelligence. So when we started looking at collective intelligence and teams, we were really building off of uh, you know, a basis where prior to our work, when we thought about intelligence and teams, it was as a function of the, the individual intelligence of the members. So if you wanted a smart team, you needed smart people. But I think all of us know about teams where we have some smart people, but the team does not work very well. You have stars you know, on sports teams, and the team fails. You have other teams where people are unremarkable, but they perform beyond what you would expect. And so based on these sorts of observations and experiences, we came to think, well, there's really a collective intelligence that can characterize how teams perform that is independent of the abilities of members. And if we could identify that, measure it, perhaps we could use it to predict how teams will perform in the future. And so to cut to the chase, uh, my first year here uh, in this very building, we collected a lot of data. We brought teams together for a better part of a day. They worked on a bunch of tasks. And we got strong support for this hypothesis that certain teams perform well across a lot of different situations. And when we essentially gave them our group version of an IQ test, we could predict how they performed in the future when we brought them back together to do, in this case, a video game simulation. And we could predict much better than knowing the IQ of the individual members of the team. Uh, and so over time, we've replicated this and repeatedly found that collective intelligence is a much better predictor uh, of team performance, especially compared to either the maximum or the average uh, intelligence of uh, team members. Over time, we've come to also look at, OK, well, if it's not individual IQ that's predicting collective intelligence, what is? One of the things that turned up very early on was this correlation between the number of women in the team and collective intelligence. However, over time, what we found is that it's really a curvilinear effect where teams benefit from gender diversity with a tilt toward having more women. So uh, in this sample, which includes about 500 teams, uh, this is average collective intelligence. Teams were consistently above average when they were majority female. However, when they became all female, they went back down to being uh, average. So, uh, so gender diversity seems to be beneficial. We find the same effect when we look at ethnic diversity and when we look at cognitive diversity as well. This consistent curvilinear effect where teams cannot reach the highest levels of collective intelligence unless they are at least moderately diverse. We've also found an effect associated with individual team member skills at picking up on subtle nonverbal cues. Uh, people who can pick up on cues and draw uh, correct inferences about what others are thinking or feeling can, can just pick up a lot more information in the team environment. Uh, and so in this case, this is a test where we do it using facial expressions. However, this ability translates across different modes of communication and different modes of interaction. We find that uh, individuals who have these skills also facilitate interaction even online uh, using text chat. Uh, and so th this is another important component of collective intelligence. So as we kind of abstract what the things are uh, that lead to collective intelligence, we find that group composition, especially diversity, together with abilities that enable team members to pick up more information from their social interactions are an important component. A second piece uh, relates to having group structures that facilitate a high level and equality of communication. And over and over again, we find that teams that have one or a few people dominating the conversation are a lot less collectively intelligent. So if we abstract this up a little bit further, what we essentially are saying is that collective intelligence is built on the number and the quality of the individuals in the system and the quality of their connections. And in looking at it this way, it starts to suggest other ways that you can compose teams, perhaps integrating more technology uh, in, in a manner that would enhance collective intelligence. So as we think about technology, and especially moving into all the recent uh, research in AI, much of that is focused on what we call production technology, or technology that actually helps the individual actors do things either faster or more effectively. And these are the technologies that may replace humans uh, someday. And so a lot of the, the hype in the media is focused on production technologies. Uh, and so we could conceive of making a team more collectively intelligent by replacing some of the members with technologies that would do their jobs better. However, a, a, a less 
uh, extensively considered uh, aspect is uh, what we call coordination technologies. These are technologies that would actually enhance the connections among the individual members, either making communication faster, more efficient, uh, more equally distributed, if you will. And so this is what we focused on in our research. Another thing to think about in considering technology is what level of machine intelligence is integrated. When we talk about artificial intelligence, that actually uh, refers to a broad array of machine intelligence intelligences that could be integrated. And so at the lowest level of uh, machine intelligence is what we would call a tool. We've had these uh, around for decades now, things like Skype or spreadsheets, things that enhance your ability uh, to do your work. But the human remains in control when using the tool. The tool is simply augmenting the, the human's ability. The next level would be an assistant. This is a, a slightly higher level of intelligence where the technology is anticipating what you might need to do or what you might need to know, uh, Siri prompting you that you need to leave now for the airport to make your flight given the current traffic conditions, for example, would be an example of an assistant. The highest level uh, is what we call a manager. This is technology telling you what to do. And in fact, maybe even forcing you um, to do things in a, in a certain way uh, in order to perhaps enhance the entire system because the technology would know. Uh, so Google Maps telling you, for example, you know, go down this road because the road that you think you want to take is backed up with traffic. So the technology is using information that you don't have to direct your actions. And a manager in that case might even, uh, you know, when we're in the self-driving car age, just steer your car uh, you know, down the path uh, that would have less traffic. That would be an example of a manager technology. In theory, the smarter the technology, the smarter the group should be. However, we're working with humans. And those who took my class know humans are messy. Uh, and one of the things that makes humans messy uh, is this uh, notion of algorithm aversion. We, even though we might have very smart algorithms, a lot of times we don't want to listen to them. We want to override them. And so that's a very big part of the design of many of these technologies, is not only how smart can we make it, but how can we help the humans to trust and actually use it. Uh, and so one of the uh, more recent sets of findings has shown, well, if the human can slightly control it, can see under the hood and maybe alter it, they're a little more likely to go along with it. So as we went through our studies, and I'm going to mention a few in a moment, uh, we were wondering, is it the case that having the smartest technology is always going to be the way to enhance collective intelligence, or are we going to have to you know, maybe only integrate a moderate level in order to let the humans have some say and feel control, uh, et cetera, in order for them to actually comply? So, uh, so that um, is what is uh, shaping some of our studies. So I'm going to tell you about three studies where we uh, looked at three different levels of uh, machine intelligence. And so the first one was a tool. Uh, we had teams working together, we simply gave them a to-do list. And what this did is it got teams to just talk about who should do what and to organize their work and to keep track of it. Uh, smart teams do this naturally. By having the list, it prompted all teams to do it. And what we found was a significant uh, improvement in collective in intelligence as a function of having this very simple tool available to the teams. A second study, a uh, slightly uh, higher level of intelligence integrated, we're giving them real-time feedback about effort. Because another big problem in teams, as many of us know, especially maybe from your time at Tepper, sometimes you have slackers. And people don't put in the effort, right? None of you here were one of those. But <laughs> hypothetically, I've heard about that. Uh, and so uh, if you're getting real-time feedback, then you, it's very clear who the slacker is. And then hopefully they'll raise their effort, and the team overall will do better. And that is, in fact, what we found, that teams that had this real-time feedback would increase their effort. And if they did, they were much more collectively intelligent. However, there were some teams that didn't necessarily raise their effort. And so the effect overall was null of, the, of this manipulation on collective intelligence. But if those uh, teams that did raise their effort uh, did so, then they were more collectively intelligent. So some people were reacting. They're like, hey, you're calling me a slacker. Well, I'm just going to stop working altogether. Or maybe the person who was doing all the work when nobody else was working would withdraw their effort. So we saw some of those dynamics uh, in these teams. In the final study, we integrated a manager. We had a bot who actually came into uh, the online platform where the team was working and said, hey, you know what? Smart teams would consider this, or maybe you should talk about that. 
And so we were curious, first of all, just how people would react to this bot. So we asked them, do you think this bot is a person or a bot? And if so, how competent are they? And what we found, so what was said was exactly the same. But if they thought it was a human, they thought it was much more competent than if they thought it was a bot. So that was our first observation, that they were going to have this reaction. Um, but then finally, and uh, this is this bar here, uh, the groups that had this manager performed worse, actually, than our control condition, certainly than our to-do list, or the groups that had the, the real-time feedback who actually raised their effort. So the highest level of intelligence that we tried to integrate in terms of the machine intelligence resulted in the lowest level of performance in these teams, uh, which, which has been interesting. So as we move forward, we're going to continue to uh, look at you know, how could we refine this bot? You know, could we hand some control over to the team in some way so they could benefit from the intelligence and yet uh, you know, also comply and not reject it? Uh, and so that's what we're looking at uh, moving forward. So thank you very much. These are the collaborators, as I say we, uh, who are Stanford, MIT here. Uh, and so so we look forward to uh, continuing to develop these results and share them with you and hopefully make your team smarter. <laughs>